My name is Chris McConnell. I direct the Alaska Network of Energy Education and Employment Program at REAP, which I'll talk about a little bit. I'm glad that you're all here, and um, it's always interesting when you're in the face of a worldwide pandemic or free hors d'oeuvres. So uh, thank you for braving, braving that and joining us. Um, and as Bodil mentioned, I'd also like to um, give an acknowledgement to the Denai people for um, specific to this evening, the homes and the structures that they built. And um, just looking into it a little bit, 10,000 years ago, um, the archeologists have discovered oval shaped homes with a central hearth, step down um, entry, um, interior um, fish pit storage, and really the, the earliest signs of any cold storage beneath the ground anywhere in Alaska. Um, so to the point that this ingenuity has existed for a long time. Um, building science has ex existed for a long time. We have, uh, we've come a long way and we have a long way to go. And so um, I'm, I'm glad to have our panelists here to discuss this. Um, a note about my program and why I'm sitting up here is just m part of my mission at Alaska Network of Energy Education and Employment is to look at everywhere in Alaska where there's any sort of um, energy training and energy literacy learning opportunities and trying to connect that with um, a career pathway, workforce development. And so in that work, I've been lucky enough to travel all around Alaska and a lot of the glamour projects in clean and renewable energy are what you see on Fire Island or hydro projects, but really where a lot of the jobs are, where the money is, is in efficiency, and a lot of that is essentially in our Alaska um, housing and building stock. And so um, that's brought me in contact with school districts, with um, commercial buildings, with facility managers, and it just, there's a wide array of both jobs tasks and technology that come into play there. Um, and so that's how I've got to know some of the gentlemen up here tonight. Um, just a little note on the format. We're going to try to make it conversational. i um, going to throw some questions out. And so uh, I'll give a bio for each of these gentlemen. And hopefully um, they'll ask each other some questions. And then um, towards the end of the evening, there'll be a chance for a Q&A for any of you to ask questions as well. Um, so before I introduce you, I guess the, the big difference that I think between building science and rocket science is uh, building science has yet to produce an Elon Musk type <laughs> character. And so a humble goal of this evening is that uh, the last man standing is going to be the debonair, <laughs> dashing, um, inspirational figure that takes building science um, to the glamour it deserves. Um, so what I'm going to do is introduce um, each of them and then I think they'll have a chance to talk about uh, an aspect of their specific work and then we'll open it up to discussions. Uh, and I'm going to go in order of introduction, um, I'm going to go our last first, meaning that Alan will discuss his work after everyone else has. Alan Mitchell. Alan owns Analysis North, which performs energy modeling, energy monitoring, economic analysis, and software development. Alan was the primary developer of the AK Warm Energy Rating Software, the BMON Building Monitoring Software, and the Alaska Heat Pump Calculator. Alan has over 50 years of Alaskan residency and degrees in electrical engineering from Stanford and Stanford and Energy and Resources from UC Berkeley. Um, Bridging the Stanford Berkeley gap is, <laughs> is amazing itself. <clears throat> we also uh, have Dale Smythe. Dale is um, a member of the American Institute of Architects, is a born and raised Alaskan and senior architect at Bettisworth North. He works to design facilities that meet the unique needs of our environment, culture, and location. He's been working to help clients meet their needs in rural and urban Alaska for the last 19 years designing military, multifamily residential, commercial, healthcare, and educational facilities. Dale believes a built environment can be as balanced and beautiful as a natural environment and is honored to live and work here. Dale is a devoted community volunteer and serves in a leadership role with the Association for Learning Environments and, has, and as a member of the Alaska Department of Education and Early Development's Bond Reimbursement and Grant Review Committee, which researches design, best practices, outcomes, and policy. Which high school? Yeah. Robert Service. All right, Service. <laughs> uh, 
um, we'll ask you to recite a poem uh, <laughs> shortly. Um, Mark Masteller is an assistant professor in the Renewable Energy Program at the Matsu College. Previously, he worked as the Alaska Director for Cascadia Green Building Council, a not-for-profit chapter of, of both the U.S. and Canada Green Building Councils. Mark has worked in Alaska for 29 years in both urban and rural areas. He's worked for 19 years as a wildlife biologist, eight years as the director of the Alaska Center for Appropriate Technology. He is dedicated to developing ecological, sustainable communities and helping people address the significant challenges found across this geographically and culturally diverse and beautiful state. Mark graduated from Colorado State University with a bachelor's and master's degree in wildlife biology. Um, and I've had the pleasure of uh, working with Mark and crisscrossing um, the state with him, and he's uh, an amazing conversationalist. Grab a beer with him, and you will be educated. Um, so I think we're going to kick things off with uh, Mark, who's going to give us a little bit of um, a background on building science in general. I was glad to see the subtitle, which I know Chris has mentioned often that you know, we're kind of wasting at least a billion dollars on wasted energy every year. And uh, so this topic gets at part of that billion dollar bonfire that, that was mentioned in the earlier. So in 2012, uh, specific to this event, uh, I wanted to just highlight this particular report, which the state did on public facilities in the state. And I'll just run through a couple real highlights of it. I can't see it, but so in 2012, the state estimated they were spending about 640 some million dollars on energy costs on public buildings. And that with average, you know, with just a little bit of work, we could be saving 30% of that or so, or $125 million a year. That's not chump change. That, you know, that's with not doing deep retrofits or just doing some work on these buildings. So that, that I think that that's really important to understand is that that's money that's almost low-hanging fruit that we need to be collecting, right? Especially when uh, times are tough, like they are right now. Don't worry about the third one. We're not going to get into EUIs. Um, if nothing else, if you go away from tonight thinking, you know, from an energy literacy perspective, you go away thinking, remembering that the first cost of the building is significant. You know, whenever we build a school or whatever, it's a big deal. But what we pay to operate that school is way more in the long run. So energy costs are in the blue, you know, 50% of your, over the 40 years of a, of a building, and of course our public facilities often last a lot longer than 40 years. But this just gives you an idea. New, cons you know, your new cost is a relatively minor cost when you start thinking about the longer term. So hopefully we're thinking about the longer term. <coughs> Last one. So recommendations that came out of this report. Lots of things we can be doing. We can be educating people, building owners, building operators, users. We can get data, which Alan's going to talk a lot more, metering the buildings. Uh, we can put in equipment controls. We can think about policy that's related to all this, which everybody here has an option to affect a policymaker. And we can do things like energy managers and energy codes. I look at that whole list and I go, there's a lot of jobs here. There's a lot of jobs in this work. So I get kind of excited about that. And I'm going to stop there. Dale, it's all yours. So to me, that's a lot more personal. Born and raised here, I want to stay here. That's the photo of some of my family right there. And I want to build schools and projects that allow us to stay here, that are sustainable, uh, that are sustainable from both the environmental standpoint, but also the um, uh, economical standpoint. Um, I think what uh, really caught me working up here was just the unique challenges that you don't find many other places in the world, whether that's the environment, the culture, um, soils, climate, and location. And there, I mean, you can see some of the things uh, that are just amazing about this place and getting to travel around it. Um, the other part of it that I think is, is unique to the field of architecture and building design, that's okay. usually involved in the first part, but it affects everything down the line. And it's that operational cost that's become really important to me. And so I, I've been lucky enough to get appointed to um, uh, the BRGR, which is short for Bond Reimbursement and Grant Review Committee. It's a volunteer appointment, but it is uh, through the state of Alaska Department of Education and two of the
Conditions for design ratios that designers follow to ensure energy efficient operation. And I'll talk about one. There's four main ones um, uh, that are uh, number one being exterior wall to opening. So how many windows and doors on an exterior elevation. And then the others that you can read here really about compactness. You know, Ed Bryce, the building in the north, the most compact form you can have is hemisphere, dome, doesn't really uh, work well for schools. So outside of that, what um, volumes or design ratios that affect uh, space, floor plate, and volume uh, are more cost efficient. So we were able to get uh, House Bill 212 funded a study to start this. So we um, got four different, um, oh, you can see that, four different uh, climate zones and studied uh, a myriad of ratio options dealing with everything from window to wall ratios, volume as I mentioned, two-story spaces, all based on a, a certain model school so that we could compare them. Um, not only energy use all over the state, so the four climate zones per um, AHFC, which uh, in our model, Wainwright, um, Bethel, Dillingham, and Juneau. And then also uh, within that, comparisons of two-story space, as I mentioned, the other volume options. And um, so that's been fantastic, because as a professional architect working for clients, the, the academic aspect of comparing those is very rare. Um, your limited budgets, limited time. Um, we work on uh, rules of thumb sometimes. Uh, two-story versus one-story, pretty basic, lower volume, less roof. Uh, but what's the real savings? And the interesting part about this, the analysis hasn't been complete. We haven't developed the guidelines yet. Um, some of the savings wasn't as much as we had thought. It wasn't modeled as much anyways. Um, but, but again, it's all modeling. Um, but it has been uh, a fantastic exercise that I think is gonna uh, continue to influence um, design requirements for s replacement school construction in Alaska, and I'm really excited about that. So, thank you. Um, thanks for the introduction, Chris, and uh, thanks for inviting me to these things. Like I'm, I'm already learn I'm, I'm not even aware of some of the things that are going on in energy in the state. It was interesting to hear the work you're doing, Dale. It sounds uh, really interesting. I get to hang out with Mark a fair amount, so <laughs> I do know what Mark's up to. Um, so I spent a lot of the early part of my career actually building models, uh, energy models. I was, as Chris pointed out, the primary developer of the ACWARM home energy rating software, which uh, models mo initially residential buildings to help uh, determine energy use and to determine energy savings. And then uh, we modified it to, to make an attempt at modeling smaller commercial buildings as well. Um, but in the latter part of my career, I've, I've been much more involved with actually um, looking at real data and actual energy performance of buildings. And recently, I've been doing a fair amount of work with Alaska Housing Finance Corp. And Tyler Boys is over there in the third row. Um, he's the, the head of the, the program that I've been spending a fair amount of time with. If you've heard the acronym BMON, Building Monitoring, that's, uh, that's the project that I've been heavily involved with. And essentially, um, it's, uh, it's work to gather data, which I'll talk about in a little bit, from buildings um, on a, on a real-time basis. And, and so far, there have been over 170 buildings in Alaska that actually have implemented some of this. And so the data, the data we're collecting is, um, is sort of high-resolution data in terms of we're getting 10 minute, uh, 10 minute to 30 minute uh, energy use data or energy related data from these buildings. And we're, we're transferring it to the internet and making it available for viewing and for analyzing on basically a, a real time basis. Um, and the, the kinds of things we're measuring are, are temperature, electric power consumption, uh, fuel consumption, uh, lighting status, whether lights are on or off. <coughs> And actually, if, uh, if you came early, you might have seen the, there's a, there's a computer screen in the back of the room. There, there are actually a number of sensors in this building, and, and you can see a dashboard back there that's sort of displaying some of the information that's, that's coming from those sensors. Um, so the, the legitimate question is, why? Why bother with this? And um, so the big motivation we have at Alaska Housing is to attempt to identify energy savings opportunities from, from this data, and I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, 
Also, Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium is using this system in over 60 of their rural water and sewer facilities in the state. Their, their primary motivation is to identify when systems are freezing up or there is some kind of a catastrophic failure likely to happen with the system. And in fact, um, they indicate that one thing they, they caught they caught with the monitoring system probably saved them a $300,000 repair on one of their water plants. Uh, there was a leak in the plant and the system uh, sent out an alarm and they identified the leak. So that's another, another use of this kind of data. Um, it's a good way to, um, to verify savings, energy savings, if, if you actually do say, uh, some sort of energy efficiency measure in a building. Um, so, and then this, this slide right here is sort of one example of, of how you can use this data to potentially identify energy saving opportunities. So that's, those are two different schools. Um, that's a graph of electric use across the hours of a, of a day in the school. So this is, a, this is a weekday and you can see during the middle of the day, you know, there's obviously higher electric use and then at night it reduces. Um, if you look at the blue school versus the red school, the red school, uh, because they are more on top of making sure things actually get turned off in the middle of the night and on the weekends, you can see their energy use is dramatically less during the nighttime than the daytime. And it turns out that if you could uh, find out what's going on in that school that's the blue line and, and bring it down aligned with with the school that's the red line, the savings would be about $60,000 a year or 29% or of the energy bill. So um, there's really an opportunity there. This doesn't tell you what the problem is, but it, it definitely shows you where to look. And uh, so this is one of the things we're trying to, and that data is, is derived from 15 minute data that came from the electric utility. It, it actually came from smart meters that the electric utility already has in place and we get this data pump, um, piped into our system for free, essentially. We didn't have to install sensors or anything to get this data. So it's very low cost data and, and pretty informative. Um, let's see. And as Mark pointed out, 63 grand is another teacher for that school, potentially, minus healthcare. Yeah. And then this is just a little a little show of some of the, the new technology we're, we're starting to, to work with. Uh, these are, the, the upper left is, is a battery powered sensor. There's one on the wall over here. This, this sensor measures carbon dioxide, temperature, humidity. It actually measures the light levels so you can tell whether lights are on or off. Um, and it has a motion detector in it. So it has all those things and it's about $260, it's battery powered, the batteries last five to 10 years, and there's a tremendous amount of data that can come from this, this one sensor. Um, this is the upper right sensor, it's, a, it's another battery powered wireless sensor. It measures temperature and humidity and, and another external temperature, like you could measure a pipe temperature or a temperature in a duct. And this is a $30 unit here. And, and both of those sensors actually um, get their data onto the internet via talking to this little $90 gateway. This gateway just plugs into the wall, connects to the Wi-Fi network in your building, and this is what, what gets the data from those sensors on, onto the internet. So, so that's a little sampling of, of some of the technology we're using. Thank you, Alan. Um, I want to uh, throw some questions out there, and, and I wanted the, the first one to um, mention um, how many of you are, show of hands, familiar with the Cold Climate Housing Research Center? Oh, nice. Great. And so obviously um, if you're in Alaska and you're talking about building science and you're keeping track of building science, you, you realize what an absolute asset to the state of Alaska and really some, some world leaders in thought they are. Um, REAP, Everybody up here has experience working closely with them, learning from them, and they've informed this discussion tonight. They couldn't be here because I think they're sort of um, focusing more directly on the work than they are um, outreach and opportunities like this because of that word we hear all the time in this state now is fiscal austerity. Um, but it, it's just worth reminding what an absolute sort of jewel it is 
of the intellectual uh, capacity our state has and people that are working to make lives, um, the, the lived lives in homes, which is where they focus mostly, um, better. And I just wanted to kick things off and, and ask each of you if or where your work is intersected with um, CCHRC. Mark? Absolutely. Um, so they have a wealth of information at CCHRC that we can all access. So for instance, if we're doing, say, a building science class or something like that, we have access to that data. Plus, as Chris mentioned, um, we, we've worked very closely with them. One of my colleagues used to work at the campus that I work at. So uh, it is a tremendous resource for the state of Alaska. And one thing that I think I appreciate it with CCHRC is uh, there's a lot of cultural sensitivity in their, the way they do business. And I'm, I'll just a quick anecdote, you know, they, they have gone into several, many communities now to build a high performance home, often using 90% less energy than the average home in the community. And they don't, not each home looks the same, which, you know, we've had an issue in Alaska where lots of times we just figure out, okay, this will work and we're just gonna put it everywhere. But CCHRC goes into the community and says, what do you folks want? What do you want your home to look like? And that's why every home has looked different in different communities, still with the same energy performance. So it's, that kind of sensitivity is, is welcome in my view. And that flows from Jack A. Bear, the founder, who I think is, is especially um, knowledgeable about native waves of yeah. building. Um, yeah, really, uh, as we discussed earlier, to me, it's the um, comparison of my specialty is more the school, school scale building or institutional. Uh, the building science things are mostly the same, right? All of the things that are important that CCHRC has done through research and um, analysis uh, are the same. Moisture management, um, uh, whether that's from interior to to exterior uh, vapor drive, all those elements are still key to having long lasting um, efficient buildings. And I think taking those uh, basics, the examples, the good design principles, and then uh, you scale up for school and more complicated controls, et cetera. But it's uh, definitely uh, invaluable. Yeah, I guess um, I work with CCHRC almost every week. Uh, I subcontract to them, they subcontract to me, and I guess I'd just like to point out what, what incredible people they are to work with, both, I mean, both intellectually and their passion and their, their belief in all this. Um, I'm working on a project right now to help them design a, a heat pump test chamber up in Fairbanks. And I, and I guess I'd like to say the, most, the person I've done the most work with is Dustin Madden, who is actually their staff person here in Anchorage. And, Dustin has worked on the monitoring software and he, uh, we haven't released this feature yet, but he's developed a number of, of reports that we're going to run nightly that basically take all this data and try to present it in a way that's, that's understandable and will allow people to, to take action and, and save energy with it. And he's a perfect person for that. He, he has energy knowledge. He, he now, in the last five or six years, has learned how to write code. And he used to be a teacher, so he's really um, proficient in explaining information to people in, a, in an understandable way. So I, I just have a lot of good things to say about the staff and, and, and their efforts. And uh, I think that visiting their website, and uh, we'll move on from them, but Tom Marsick, one of their lead researchers, has a Guinness Book of World Records for the tightest house in the world. Anymore. In Dillingham, oh, currently beat. Oh, I need to update my stats. Well, is he going to move back to Dillingham and <laughs> tighten things up? And, um, I learned it from him. He he no, he no longer has the record, wow. but he had he had a home that, I mean, 0 0.05 air changes per hour is, you know, 60 times better than what Alaska housing requires for a five star plus home. So anyway, yeah, that's good. And. Um, I also want to acknowledge that, that Tyler Boys is here and Alaska Housing Finance um, is also really an asset to, to the state in terms of what they contribute to building science. And feel free to go back to the dashboard over there. 
Um, it's been a partnership with HFC that Tyler's been instrumental to and Bodil to get this building to be a living laboratory for students, for um, potentially contractors, for the general public to see what it means to um, the, I think Lord Kelvin was responsible for the quote, um, you can't manage what you can't measure. So we're measuring. Um, moving on but to just sort of lay some uh, groundwork for the conversation, I, want, I thought it would be uh, interesting to just throw out some, some terminology or concepts um, and have you define them for those that may not know. Um, Dale, EUI and ECI. Okay, I'll, I'll skip it if you, uh, it, it's, uh, so EUI stands for? Correct. And so ECI, Energy Cost Index. Mark, take that one. So, well, no, I'm going to go to EUI again. Energy Use Index, the, the, in, the great thing about that metric is that that allows us to compare energy use no matter what size the building is. Mm -hmm. And I flip back to this slide on purpose because this is that study I told you about in 2012, public building. Notice the range. You know, 33,000 BTUs per square foot per year, up to 1.9 million <laughs> BTUs per square foot per year. There's a problem. <laughs> but, but if you don't do the benchmarking, if you don't go out there and measure, you're not going to even know that. So, so this, and, and just to go a little forward, think about asking policymakers or school districts or somebody to set a goal this is the kind of thing you might say, I want a performance goal. I want that school to achieve X e, uh, e, 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 U, I, whatever the number is. But that way, it doesn't matter how they build it, if they can achieve an energy performance <coughs> metric, then we know we're getting the performance. Sorry. Yeah, and I guess I, the one thing I'd add on the um, EUI versus ECI, EUI is this that you add up all the BTUs of energy in the building divided by the square feet. Um, one disadvantage of that measure is it counts electric BTUs the same as fuel BTUs and it's, it's very difficult and expensive to create an electric BTU versus a fuel BTU. And so to some degree ECI is a little better measure because uh, that gets captured that, uh, that uh, a BTU of electricity costs a lot more than a BTU of fuel. So it's a little better about uh, dealing with that issue. Okay, so a test question here. I have the answer in front of me. Um, so the energy cost index, um, and this is off of the HFC report, which granted was uh, um, not a randomized sample of public buildings throughout the state. However, what would you guess the uh, energy cost index, and that's per square foot, And annually, uh, annual average. Annual. From 2012, right? Uh, yeah, so, yes, yeah, six years ago. This is a very tricky question. I don't know how much is it. Yeah, excuse me. So uh, all I do is read the answers, Chris. I'm not doing the math. I'll throw it out there. It's uh, $4.31. Did you say? $4.31, and to the layman, clearly, um, that, that is a good reference point when you think about um, all the buildings um, throughout Alaska. And then um, maybe this is a good point. Um, Dale, I'm going to pick on you again. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about um, the climate zones?
There's, there's anomalies, I think. There's anomalies like um, it, the cost, and I'm going to, this is a rough estimate. I think it's like twice the cost per square foot in Anchorage school buildings than it is Fairbanks. Um, and, that and even though we have um, cheaper energy, and that's because they're doing a better job on the efficiency end. Yeah, they've made a really concerted effort in Fairbanks. I mean, they have an energy manager and they've been working on it. It's, it's impressive. And I want to uh, put a pin in the energy manager because I think that, that that's important that maybe all of you can speak to. Um, Dale, you mentioned it, so I want to just define it quickly. What is bees? Oh, so that's the, uh, oh man, you're putting me on the spot. Because it's a residential program that really we, is not used in commercial construction at all. Building, Building energy efficiency standards. Yes, exactly. Um, developed for residential construction, correct? Right. Yeah. And so it's a standard, not a code. Uh, required by the specific financing, but yeah. So uh, talking about public facilities, um, uh, done by the state right now, specifically schools would not be required otherwise to follow that. And now other states do have sort of mandated it. Does it, um, mandated codes of efficiency, um, Alaska is not. Is, do, is that something we can look forward to in the future? And I don't mean just residential, but in our, our public buildings. Yeah, I think these guys would have great input on that. The, the Right now for schools, the Department of Education for state funding, anyways, does have standards. So uh, our values, for instance, through ASHRAE. Um, and that, I think, is where they are a bit ahead of maybe some other state agencies in requiring that. Um, but in, in other, um, other departments and other structures, uh, you're kind of uh, not a lot. Not a lot's there. We don't have a statewide building code, but any home that, or multifamily that, and correct me, Tyler, if I get off base here, any home that gets Alaska housing financing needs to meet the B's standard, yeah. which, is a, which is an advantage, or at least I think it's a good thing. <laughs> Can you explain the sentence with this? We don't have a statewide building code? Building code. Right. Many, contact, many, so many places, many states would have a minimum code is, I like to think of codes as like a minimum set of standards, you know, minimum what you've got to do to do whatever you're doing. Plumbing code, electrical code or whatever. Many places have a minimum set of building requirements for a home in, in their state. Residential. We don't, yeah. And, and. It's true for commercial, to, or it's true, true for public buildings too. Except that the public buildings, they, like the school districts or they, the Department of Education might set their own standards. So just a clarification, outside of energy codes, so the, anything that's, any um, place that's not within an organized borough or a, set, or a municipality that has adopted codes defaults to the state and the state does uh, default to the International Building Code. And that family of codes. So there, there are codes there, um, but uh, currently it's it's limited in what is in covered by now the International Energy uh, Code. Yeah. So IECC. Yeah. Alan, um, just a clarification because I think a lot of people get them confused or or muddle them a little bit. And that is, what is the difference between uh, monitoring and managing? Um, well, I guess. I would view monitoring as the process of actually collecting data from the building. Um, like what we're doing here is we're doing monitoring. We're collecting energy use data, temperature data. Managing, I think, would be acting upon that data um, and doing something with it, uh, attempting to shape or reduce the energy use or the operation of the building. And so I'm going to ask you a question now. And this, I guess, goes a little bit to rural Alaska. Um, where the, the capacities are different within a community of, say, 500 people that you might not have an energy manager that is able to, to devote eight hours a day to watching things. Do you, do you think um, man versus machine, a skilled, energy, um, a skilled manager, a skilled fil facilities manager, is he as valuable as a monitoring system? I know one's a tool and one's a person, but I'm thinking of a school building with a conscientious facilities manager um, just watching the building versus 
a monitoring system that maybe someone is or remotely? Is that a challenge? Is it relevant? Yeah. Well, I think you put your finger on on a really critical issue. Um, I'm a little disappointed. You know, I, I look at a lot of this data and I see opportunities, and yet um, we're, we're just kind of slowly using the data in, in a useful way. And unfortunately, I, I think um, a skilled facilities manager has to know about a lot of different things. I, I think to actually make, make this data actionable, you need to have someone who has some fairly high level energy skills. And I think you're absolutely right. You can't hire one of those for every building. It need, there needs to be some sort of mechanism whereby that person can be shared across an entire school district or, or a large set of buildings. So I, I think the, the right solution to the problem is to have some sort of an, uh, a very specific energy manager who knows how to look at this kind of data and see, see issues. And because it's on the internet, it, it a lot of times can be done remotely and then work closely with the facility manager who actually understands the building to get to get some of these things implemented. You know, and part of the problem is I think facility managers have no idea how much these things cost and how much, you know, turning not turning the heat back or leaving the lights on or a big one, you know, running too much ventilation here. I think they have no idea uh, how much those issues cost in terms of energy. So. Um, so I, I really think it's a, you need a separate skilled energy manager working with a, a facility manager. And Dale, with your extensive experience with school districts, is that likely, is, have you seen any movement in that area as far as a school district implementing that model? Exactly, it, it varies, uh, the challenge, and it varies dramatically through site, and really the challenge comes down to the, what uh, resources are available in that community, and like you get into some of, the, some of the smaller communities, the facilities guy there may have been the janitor last year, and there's really uh, the just limited choice in who you have available to hire, and that has been in the last 19 years has been consistently one of the most difficult challenges in working with facilities directors um, for all the school districts that I've worked with. I mean, you'll you'll have uh, the hub area, whether it's Dillingham or Bethel, um, you'll have guys that that know buildings and they know. Uh, systems and efficiency, uh, but the guy at the site, you know, they have to they have to keep the building warm. Yes, that is their goal. Do not let it freeze up. And really, uh, as priorities go down the line, um, because they're not the one maybe paying the bill um, or recognizing the cost of those changes. Uh, th at the end of the day, um, if if the building ha if school hasn't froze up, they've done a fantastic service, and it's it's really uh, flipping that. Um, mindset over and if, and if if somebody in the community is not happy with the way the buildings working they call that person they don't call the energy manager in Bethel mm -hmm. and and so that leads into mark I think nicely is mark you were formerly um, posted at uh, University of Alaska Fairbanks Bristol Bay still am still <laughs> still am though yeah. remotely in the valley and so you have um, educated quite a few people throughout rural Alaska. Do, do you, how is that going as far as um, increasing that capacity um, at a hub level or a village level? It's a, it's a constant struggle because there's lots of different opportunities in different communities and uh, none of these jobs are typically full-time jobs. Often they are not full-time jobs. So a, a person has to want to either do something part-time or they have a skill, they have multiple skill sets where they are doing several jobs. So I would say uh, just from the whole educational perspective, you know, we, we deal with the theory of how things work and uh, uh, the, the training on the ground, I, I think there needs to be more of it. I'm not sure how that's gonna happen, or where that's gonna happen. Um, I'm gonna back up a little bit and um, go not just to school buildings, but I think a, a primary concern, um, and a, again, a concept term, Alan, tell us about um, life cycle cost. So life cycle costs is, um, is generally applied to a project or an option. Like if, if, for example, if you're looking at replacing a heating system and you have two choices, uh, life cycle cost is looking at all the costs 
including the initial cost to, to put in the heating system, the cost to operate it, cost to maintain it, the cost to replace it. And so it's a technique, if, if it's done properly, allows you to, to make choices between two different options. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, I, I think everybody looks a bit at all those costs. Uh, like, for example, when consumers go out to buy a car or refrigerator, they do think somewhat about not just the first cost, they think about the operating cost. But um, unfortunately, consumers tend to look two or three years down the road, um, either because they don't have much money or there's some uncertainty about the choices they're making. So they have a very short time frame. And businesses may have a, a few year longer time frame or maybe not. Um, and because of those short time frames and the fact that people don't analyze uh, costs over the entire life of a, of a project or a piece of equipment, uh, we frequently don't buy as much energy efficiency as we should. So um, it, it's, it's a big problem. And the other, the other issue that really ought to be considered in life cycle cost is what an economist would call externalities or environmental yeah. costs or costs to the public that are aside or separate from the dollar costs. And um, I, I guess I'd like to say that I, I did a number of years analyzing uh, projects for the Alaska Energy Authority through the Renewable Energy Fund. And they actually used a life cycle costing technique that one, it, it did look at costs over the entire life of these projects. It looked at first cost, it looked at, uh, at energy cost. They actually factored in carbon cost into that analysis. So I, I was very impressed. Uh, I'd rarely seen that done, that they actually looked at, um, well, well how, my, how many carbon emissions are related to the fuel use of this project or how much are you gonna save through uh, through reducing carbon, so I thought I thought they had a very good life cycle cost process. And maybe this is a question for any of you, but where does the responsibility fall on the contractor, the designer, the <coughs> occupant customer to be making these sort of um, life cycle or right sizing um, decisions? And and Dale, maybe you start just because window ratios, I think, probably plays into that. Well, I think that's early on when I recognize the differences uh, in schools in particular between the state grant funding and then the district having the operation because they're two different things and they have two different end goals, right? The, the first one is to just get it built. And so uh, they're controlling the money at that time and, and it's getting passed on to the operational. And this happens all over. I remember uh, sitting in the municipality um, uh, code adoption um, discussions and they, a whole bunch of people from the community, builders, um, uh, people interested in, in fire codes, all talking about what we were going to adopt as a city and, and specifically the energy code. And it came up with R values of windows. And, uh, and the builders were arguing uh, the lower R value because from their standpoint, it would, would increase the cost of the house, would make it harder to sell. Their clients would have to get more financing but inadvertently passing that on to the owner, right? The person that buys that pays the difference for that. And I think um, that part of it in the life cycle uh, essence is the, is the key. There's always a tension between the owner versus the builder. I mean, the owner may want the world. The builder has to do, deal with the budget, right? If the owner's got Bill Gates, then you can build whatever you want. But that's never the case. So that, you know, these guys are always forced to deal with a budget. And until our budgets recognize the life cycle cost, in other words, until somebody says, okay, we're willing to pay 10% more now for X energy performance because we're gonna save way more than 10% over the life of the building, we're gonna run into this problem. Uh, Mark, that may be a good point. To, to lead into, um, do you know of any uh, innovative models to finance these projects that, that are energy efficient? Yes. Um, so I like to talk about a system I learned about in Homer where the, the city of Homer, recognizing that they had a lot of potential for energy savings in their own municipal buildings. Now, this is not talking about the residences in Homer or anything like that. But they just figured out, look, we could, we could probably be saving money in our own public buildings. So they established a revolving loan fund for themselves, for the city of Homer. The idea being 
basically loan to themselves on a project to make the upgrades, and then the savings from that building goes right back into the revolving loan fund. The neat thing is that, you know, so they went down and did a bunch of what we call investment grade audits, which just means spend money on a building audit, which is, it's not, they're not cheap, but they give you good data on what you should do on a building. And the city of Homer had like six or eight buildings and they did these investment grade audits. They figured out that they could, if they did certain activities on each building, they'd save about $100,000 in energy costs a year. And it was going to cost them $800,000 to do that. Well, a little bit of simple math says, I've paid off that $800,000 in eight years, right? Saving $100,000 a year. But the savings go on for many, many years. So the, to me, it was a really neat option. Now, what did the city of Homer have to do? They had to find money for the revolving loan fund, right? They had to come up with that initial pot of money. I think they did it. I'm not sure exactly they did it. I think they did it through ERA. But anyway, I thought it was pretty cool and it's an option. And the state has a revolving loan fund I don't know how much it gets used, but uh, not getting a lot of use. But that's for public facilities. And, and I think that brings up something Chris Rose has worked on quite a bit. Um, the state has passed um, the uh, CPACE, so commercial buildings can um, make energy retrofit, energy efficiency retrofits. The mechanism to fund that isn't quite there, um, but that would be a great application of, I think, a green bank is for. Um, there to be a pot of money that are essentially there's energy saving companies, ESCOs, um, that that's where they make their bones on that is by taking 40% of your energy savings and funding it up front. I know the University of Alaska Anchorage has just entered into a large ESCO contract with Siemens to do just that. And so I, I, we would hope that's coming and, and maybe be a part of the Green Bank come going to the future here. Um, Dale, you and your bio um, are part of the, it's the uh, learning environments. What is? A4LE, Association for Learning Environments. So this is more a qualitative question for you as a designer. Um, so what does that mean? I know there's been studies out there that it, it makes obviously intuitive sense. If you have a better workspace, if you have a better learning space, you're going to be performing better. The Texas School Board has shown that their sort of more comfortable classrooms show a rise in GPA, a rise in test scores. What, when you are designing, how, how are you weighing how much sunlight is good for a student? Exactly, and that's, I think, uh, specifically that window to wall ratio discussion. Um, you know, part of the modeling showed an, uh, an interface between 14% um, seemed to be between the cost of construction uh, within the ratio uh, versus the energy use. And then, so that's great. We've got that model that seems to indicate it, but um, how does that actually affect how the school functions? Because that's the other part is you're, quality, you're kind of trying to analyze what these benefits are. Uh, it's great to only think about cost or only think about energy use, but if it's not a good learning environment, and this is for any project, if it doesn't do its job as a facility, then is that really the right choice? And I think that's been the interesting part uh, with all the players, because this is a, a subcommittee with a bunch of different people from different backgrounds and, and reminding them of the real need and the use, and that's kind of across the board for any of the things we're considering relative to energy also. Is, is it still doing what it's supposed to do? Um, and so there, uh, there, to respond to the specific question, uh, daylighting is absolutely um, a requirement for facilities. I mean, we, we, especially here, especially at this latitude with light and how we use it, and it, it, sometimes it's a liability, whether it's um, heat loss or, or heat gain, solar gain, um, and balancing all those are the key, and I think one of the challenges is really doing good projects here. Alan, can you name some of the largest barriers to achieving energy savings in Alaska's public buildings? Yeah, and I think we've actually hit upon a lot of them. Um, like in my specific the work I'm doing with, with Tyler on monitoring, I, I think the biggest barrier is having people that can actually understand how to translate the data into, into actual energy savings, into, into projects uh, and actions. So, that, so that's, a, that's a big barrier. And, and unfortunately, I, th I think it has to be, a, like I said before, a, a resource that you share across multiple buildings because it's just too expensive to have one of those for for every building so in my mind that's that's a big barrier um you know the other 
Uh, the other barrier we, we've talked about, I think, is just the, the fact that if you do save energy in, in public buildings, you, you don't always get to realize all the dollar saving benefits from saving the energy. I mean, sometimes if you cut your uh, energy use cost by 20 percent, the next year's budget, may, they may take that back. They may reduce your budget. So I think uh, um, there's a, those sort of human incentive problems. And um, Alan had mentioned um, the remote maintenance workers, RMWs, um, and I think that if you're familiar with them, they're sometimes referred to as remote miracle workers. <laughs> and they're, they're a little bit of what you say. They, they typically work around water systems, but um, I've encountered them that they tell me that the second thing they do after coffee is check the BMON and they are a sort of hub resource for these communities to, to one of them is at $300,000 savings. Somebody saw that there was a freeze out going on and it's, it seems like a great opportunity. More volume of those type people is more savings and we could get into the weeds of how those are funded, but um, uh, just another asset that the state is out there that a lot of people are not aware of, funded by, I think, the EPA, by um, Indian Health Services, and BIA as well. Um, as we get to the close of the conversation portion here, I want to ask an a Anchorage-centric question, and that's for all of us here that are driving around or living our lives in Anchorage. Um, What's a particular building that um, intrigues you, inspires you, horrifies you, um, that we might all pay closer attention to when we drive by or walk through? I'll, I'll start because when I was with the Green Building Council, uh, uh, a gal came up to, to Anchorage and she got all excited with the uh, uh, ConocoPhillips building, I think it was because it was exactly like the one built in Houston. <laughs> exactly. You know, they use the same plan and all that. And we're different climate zones, right? And then in another building, she noticed all these air conditioners and all the windows that we didn't used to have in our buildings. This was a hotel, right? Now there's an air conditioner in every window. Things are changing. So anyway, uh, the, for me, the thought process of, you know, designed for the climate, for the climate zone, for what you need versus, hey, we got, these, we got this free set of plans that work in Texas. Yeah, uh, as an architect, I'll limit this to two. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> my, I really want to make Alaska more beautiful, I swear. Uh, but uh, Robert Service, we talked about high schools, you know, that was an, uh, an adaptation of a school design in Southern California, I believe. Uh, originally had breezeways between uh, the major wings and <laughs> just things that do not work there. And I remember huge courtyards after they put glazing, glazing on that were just empty, uh, uh, full of snow, wasted space. It, just a bad idea. I mean, they, uh, and I think one of the things that drove me early, you know, coming back here to work professionally was uh, the things that we can do. You heard all the horror stories. How many times designers from another place would come here and do major buildings, the PAC, some others, and, and it was just so much missed opportunity. And I think that that's the, uh, for me, those two as, a, as recognition of how much better it can be. And there are a lot of good things going on and a ton of good work. I mean, just like you had said earlier, the stuff happening uh, relative to good design, uh, which equals energy efficiency and, and saving the carbon footprint and everything are happening. And I'm so impressed and like happy to even be involved in it uh, in, in my hometown and in where we live. So. So I, I was actually going to punt on this question, but now I, I've actually thought of a, <laughs> a couple of things. Uh, one, I, I guess I'm horrified when I drive around in the middle of the night or late at night and I see all these lights on in buildings and that, you know, oh, that, yeah. that bothers me. So the graph I put up there originally that showed the two schools, the one really turned down the energy at night. Well, it turns out that that was the junior high I went to about 50 years ago. So it's an old building. But I swear there's a maintenance person there who's all over that and they shut the lights off. And so it doesn't have to be a snazzy new design, I think, to I mean, I think there's opportunity like that, that that um, almost irrespective of what the design of the facility is, there's opportunity to, to save energy. And originally, when I thought through this, I, I, I didn't have any great ideas about great buildings. And it struck me that, you know, if we had some sort of a little design, a little competition where we actually solicited people to submit their 
non-residential because we've had some residential competitions and we, we kind of know about awesome residential buildings, but if, if REAP or somebody like that would sponsor a, a little uh, energy, non-residential energy use competition where you submit your building and then we actually look at actual energy use and look at some of these issues like nighttime energy use and, and pick winners, I think it'd be interesting to to see what, what well-performing buildings might be out there. Tyler, can you obligate HFC to the sensors on that for all participating buildings? Thank you, that's a yes. Well, I, I gotta mention too, because, uh, so there's a standard out there. Anybody heard of LEED, LEED buildings? Oh, good, so I don't have to explain it. So there is this LEED standard out there. If you wanna, you know, if you wanna just adopt a standard, there's standards out there. And again, I used to work for the organization that made LEED. And we were doing a little research because when I was there, the city of Anchorage decided to get rid of their LEED requirement. Like the Matsuburo School District has a rule. Any new school is supposed to be LEED certified. Anchorage had that, and Anchorage is the only community we could find nationwide who had a LEED standard and then got rid of it. <laughs> so if you want to talk to a policymaker, when you build a lead building, you typically get a better product. Well, thank you, gentlemen. I'd, I'd like to open it up to the floor for the remaining time. Uh, um, are there any questions? Question was um, buildings we like in, in Anchorage. Um, others? Ben, I think next door is kind of a great example. The, the museum and, and knowing a bit of uh, uh, not only credit him uh, in Anchorage, but uh, Ken Maynard, uh, I got to work with, the pleasure of working with, and he was credited with the initial design and, and teams. Uh, and then I think if you look at it, the three different versions, uh, whether it was um, Kunz Pfeiffer Bettis, I think, and uh, uh, McCool Carlson Green, and some anyways, local architects that have worked on additions through it uh, that have really, I mean, pretty fascinating building for uh, Anchorage and for Alaska. I like the Anchorage Solar Building, the uh, the big building. I mean, I like a lot of buildings, but you know, it's uh, if you look at on Fifth and E, about a lot of people don't even know there's a lot of solar panels on it. But the the neat thing about that story is that you know it was a very uh, well thought out process. The owners of the building, uh, you know, they had to replace the siding on the building anyway. So they were gonna have a $40,000 cost of new siding. So this is the time to say, hey, can we do something different? Do we want to? On top of that, they had some tenants in the building who said, we want a greener building. You know, what can you do to make a greener building? So the numbers I have when they have a website, Anchorage Solar Building, I think, it was gonna cost about $110,000 for the project. They were gonna spend 40 grand on siding anyway, so they put a bunch of solar panels there instead and they got a 30% tax credit. So they were thinking about all those factors. I like that as an example. I don't know what the EUI of that building is. <laughs> I'd love to know. Because my favorite building would be the one that has a low EUI. <laughs> right. <laughs> Actually, you know, the Alaska Housing Finance uh, Headquarter building is, it has made a lot of improvements. Uh, you know, Tyler actually can show you on the monitoring system if you look at multiple years of electric use, it's actually declined substantially because wow. they've put in LED lights. Um, you know, they're, we're watching the CO2 levels in the building to, de to determine whether there's excess ventilation or, or too little ventilation. And there, you know, there's a little bit of excess. It's not terrible. I mean, it's not perfect by any means. But when you start looking at the real energy use of a number of buildings, I look at that one and it's, it's actually doing okay. Are, are we at a critical place where Alaska has some of the oldest housing or building stock, I believe, in the nation? where we do need to start looking at start over or retrofit in, in a lot of our buildings? And is there a criteria for that? Is that a legitimate question? Personally, I think it is. And, and, and I think um, it'll come, really what'll drive, like most Alaskans, I think what'll drive those upgrades are cost. I think you'll get to a point where your costs to, to run it are higher than it is to do the upgrades. And sadly, I don't know if it'll happen before that on some, uh, but that'll drive uh, that'll drive some decisions if if other resources aren't available for somebody. And it dovetails with one of the reasons Anchorage buildings tend to be less energy efficient than other places in in Alaska. Energy's cheap. 
-hmm. When something's cheap, you just use a lot of it. So if energy costs were to go up, it would, it would drive more retrofit. I think there's a lot of opportunity. I mean, 90% of our buildings, they could use retrofitting. So there's a lot of work there. There's a lot of opportunity. The buildings exist. You know, you got the embodied carbon. I think there's lots of opportunity in retrofits. I also believe there's a lot of potential in fixing what we have. And, um, you know, control systems totally awry, uh, you know, lighting taking so much energy with the ability to put in LED retrofits, uh, ec you know, excess ventilation levels. I I'll just toss out one thing. In the process of writing that report, I got a call from an engineer who was looking at a rural school. He gave me some information on, on how much ventilation, outside ventilation air was being pumped into the school. Uh, when you worked it out, it was about 55 CFM per person. That probably means nothing to you, but it's about three times what it needs to be. Um, in addition, he really thought that the ventilation was on 24 seven, that they weren't shutting it off when the school was unoccupied. If you work the numbers out on that, that's $200,000 a year they're paying to heat that ventilation air. And if they were to reduce it down to the proper level per person and shut it off when, when people aren't there, $180,000 a year of savings. Whoa. So that, that's just an example of you know, a huge problem that probably not even related to the architect's design or the engineer's design of the building. It's just, you know, poor, poor, poor operation. Operations. So on the, on the commercial non-residential public building side, I think there's tremendous potential to reduce energy without ripping stuff down. And that's one of the things I remember recognizing, you know, our value seat, wall assembly and, and roof and wall, our value seem to dominate um, energy efficiency discussions sometimes. But when you get to the scale where you're doing air exchanges, some of the value of that goes out the window because you're having to bring all that in. And I, and I think a lot of folks don't understand that as you, you hit that threshold of when, when you bring in air, that volume of air, because it's code required air, right? It's not just what you pick. Um, it's in, and what is that relative to the 55 you're talking about? It is 30 is it's 15 or 20 CFM is, yeah. is what, uh, you know. So I, I, unfortunately, I think a lot of times the buildings the air system is designed for maximum capacity. There's not, and they have more sophisticated systems now where they do demand controlled ventilation. And I don't know how much of that's going on in new, new design, but a, a lot of the existing stuff out there, it's not, it's not out there. So they're blowing in enough air to sort of uh, accommodate the maximum capacity of the school, but, but it's not being occupied to that level. So. And that's what, uh, as we're having this discussion, of, um, uh, complexity of system controls and who's operating it because as yeah. it gets more complex the efficiency goes way up and and if you can't take advantage of it what excites me on the things that you had was that with wireless technology and solid internet connections and reliable power and remote monitoring you have now this potential where things five or ten years ago that weren't affordable or were cutting exactly. edge that districts didn't want to deal with now are real options and we can get into schools and that um, you know, as an architect, I'm on the edge of that, but as we can give that to clients and to districts, I'm so excited about the potential of it. To ch it really right. changes the game. I've, I've uh, not to be a contrarian, but I, I suppose a, uh, a challenger is I've talked to some district um, facilities managers where if you, you have some of these high-tech boilers that you come in, now you have a guy that was an expert on a, a cast iron post-war boiler now he's looking at a motherboard. And so now how do you train that guy? Do you lose? And so I, I think we're definitely moving that way, but th there it's, you know, there's challenges whichever way you move. But you might be attracting the person who loves to look at a screen. <laughs> the young person the who generation. loves to look at a the screen. Next generation. Yeah. I, th I think one thing along that I'll just toss out there is unintended consequences. So uh, obviously two story, um, more efficient building envelope is better. Well two stories, you gotta have an elevator. So now yeah. you just put an elevator in Hooper Bay, Alaska. And who, man who manages that and who services that and what is the guy doing at stuff? You know, it's all those things that are kind of the other parts of the code that influence and the other operational difficulties. It's, yeah, a, yeah. It, it's a pretty fascinating and complex uh, puzzle here. Uh, it's definitely no easy silver bullet. Is there a lot of uh, cooperation in the circumpolar north over these issues? I like to say, Northern Europe is a great example for us to look at because they've had resource limitations for a lot longer. 
They've been thinking about some of these things in the passive house uh, standard came out of Germany, you know, Europe, and we can apply passive house standard to any building kind of thing. So to, I, I wouldn't say there's a lot of collaboration. I, I would imagine people at CCHRC collaborate with some, of, some building science folks over there. But I like to tell people that part of the world is a great model for us to because they've got winters, they've got the same issues, and they've usually got way more expensive energy. Well, not necessarily than us, but they've been dealing with energy shortages for, or uh, resource shortages for quite some time. Are there any uh, successful MCHP or cogeneration projects here in the city that you can share with us? MCHP. Micro combined heat and power systems. I, I know of, um, I can't name it by, it's a native corp, uh, KEI Energy is making a push and they have uh, installed some CHP at, I'm, I'm doing a bad jam with the names, but there is a, a push towards CHP. I know the Anchorage School District is looking at it. Um, and so it, it's, there is that community. Sorry not to have uh, the names and sources at my fingertips, but. As you were mentioning, they're pretty common in Europe and Asia. We're a little behind trying to catch up with them. Thank you. Yeah, and I'm not an expert in that. I can tell you that in major project, projects that I've been involved in, that, uh, that consideration's been made. The numbers have been run to the point of, of um, actual uh, model number and, and tying it into the project. So it's, it's very real and it will be here. It'll be a project that, has to, that can afford it, I think, um, for sure. Yeah, and I, I think it's driven by the demand costs are, that's where they're trying to avoid that, which are particularly high in um, Anchorage. Uh, you talked about the 14% ratio between windows and walls, and then about what works for especially students. Is there a rule of thumb there? Or? Well, that really, that was one rule of thumb. That, that one specifically related to the cost of construction and the cost of operation. Um, it definitely fits within um, school performance that we've been measuring so far. Honestly, uh, when we went and looked at existing schools all over the state, it was uh, everywhere from the low of 5%, which is crazy, I think, um, normally up there uh, above 10, all the way to 25. Um, and there is a definitive correlation in energy use uh, once you get above 20, really, and, and where the uh, where windows are located also. Is it in the commons areas or cafeteria versus classroom and some of those things? And I think it's um, that part of the potential regulation will be really important, uh, I think. It, you know, it's a, it's a, to me, it's a huge value of modeling because we can look at the solar gain. We can look at the loss, energy loss. We can look at that. But a good example for me is uh, Makatons Elementary in, in Palmer. Every single classroom is on the south facing side of that building so that those students are getting that daylighting. You know, they designed it because of that type of thing. So the modeling is so valuable to help us do this, really. How much light do kids need to learn well? How much light do kids need? Yeah, I could, there's been a lot of research done, and, and I can't tell you what the minimum is, but they, do, they can correlate test scores to access to daylight, and it is important. And, and how it happens, um, you know, those studies versus what we deal with here, the other challenge in, at this latitude is during the school year, yeah. there's typically not a lot of access to daylight anyways. And so I can't, I can't answer the specific question, um, but, it, but uh, the rule of thumb is more has been better. Uh, two limits, two limits of... Yeah, yeah I think that's yeah, a really hard thing to actually study. And I, actually, when I was at Berkeley, uh, there was in the architecture department there. They were they actually had set up some labs where they had it wasn't it wasn't kids learning, but they brought in like a typing pool. This you, I'm really old back when they used normal, <laughs> uh, normal typewriters, and they actually tried to measure productivity versus what was the temperature in the room. You know what was the humidity, airflow, things like that. But uh, I, I think it's really uh, I mean it's obviously super important because uh, how you know how much kids learn and what your productivity is oftentimes kind of swamps these energy issues that are much easier to model. <laughs> yeah. Are there any uh, programs to integrate the um, remote monitoring needs with um, our 
education at the secondary or university level that you're aware of? In one of my classes, I tell people this stuff exists because I have students of a wide variety of ages and different occupations and stuff. And I figure the more they know what's out there, then they can help, you know, ask for the right thing or tell somebody this exists, but it's all part of the whole energy literacy thing. And we're, so we're at the stage, at least in my experience, we're at the stage of letting people know the technology exists. We're not at the stage yet of having routine training for these, for these skills. I hope we'll get there. And the, I would say, it, you know, a challenge too is there, there are um, like uh, automatic building um, systems like Siemens and Johnson's that are in rural Alaska and some, some facilities, uh, school districts mostly are finding that it becomes prohibitively expensive even though they're so good because if there's a line of code gone wrong, now you have to fly in a Siemens expert that's going to be hung up in the village for a week and your, your um, savings are shot. So there's actually an effort in a few school districts I know of to get out of Siemens and Johnson, go to non proprietarial that then they would take a little more control. And then to your point of, I, I think that there's even a reluctance, I think, from some school districts, facilities, to kind of even know what's going on because once they do know they're going to need to do something um, that is going to be disruptive and that and that's not to disparage them but knowing what's going on is going to be a real eye-opener that is um, going to disrupt disrupt the the normal way of doing things i think sir so the two categories the 640 million annual energy costs for state of alaska public buildings and uh, $125 million low-hanging fruit. Are schools the largest percent of each of those categories? And if not, uh, what's the next, what is the largest? And if they are, what is the next? I did just look it up. Of that, spe <laughs> that specific study, uh, only half of the schools, that, or half of the buildings studied were schools. Uh, but it wasn't all the buildings. So I think that would be a tough thing to say. Uh, of that specific study didn't do all of them but of the ones that did half were schools and and there were other um, things because it did include some uh, more industrial type facilities with different energy usage like water treatment and some other things that were high on that list that um, uh, that also showed uh, potential improvements what one that may play into that is um, a former colleague at reap Shana Kilcoin had done a, a energy efficiency competition and I think the correctional institutes were some of the better performing buildings in the state. And that goes a little bit to human behavior um, where people are forced to behave in a certain way. You can get real energy savings, so. Low window to wall ratio. Yeah. <laughs> right. Are there any other questions? Yes. Yeah, uh, thank you for this. Very informative. Uh, favorite design solutions or uh, appropriate technology for lowering operational costs over the lifespan of the building? I'm a, I mentioned uh, what's called demand controlled ventilation and I think there's a real opportunity for that where you actually look you have sensors that measure carbon dioxide which is what we exhale and um, volatile organic compounds and control the ventilation system from that just just because as Dale pointed out the bringing in all this outside air uh, is a tremendous energy consumption. And uh, so. That's it. I, th I think the, um, again, the, the cost of those sensors, the implementation of them in the building control system is to me is everything. I mean, the, uh, that's, it, was, it was astonishing to realize how much air affects everything. I mean, we could, especially with lighting and LEDs and how and controls, that's there. Um, but on a relative scale, uh, air is the bigger deal. I guess I would say uh, having a having a performance standard built into your system. In other words, we want a building to perform to a certain standard, and it doesn't matter what type of building systems you get there. You know, as long as they're safe and all that. T t you're going you're gonna to ask for a certain uh, performance. And the second part is just 
roll life cycle costing or life cycle analysis into the purchasing process. The feds have done that, and you know, so they'll compare bids based on a life cycle cost. And that way you're getting that, you know, you can look at the escalation of fossil fuel costs. You know, you can roll some of those costs right in because we know certain things are going to escalate at a certain rate. And if you don't include that energy cost or energy uh, inflation rate in, you're not getting a good picture of what's going on from a cost perspective. I imagine the answer to this will be it depends on the details, but I know in really tight residential homes you can get air to air heat exchangers um, and also a humidity exchange as well. But is that a commonly economic thing to install in public buildings too? Well, I can tell you um, from the perspective of modeling, that was the next step of like, let's see, because it is, it's, it's available. Uh, it does have co add costs and it does have maintenance issues that go along with that, um, but it is an option. And I think that was the thing that we were uh, moving on to the next steps of it was to, were to include some elements like that. Uh, also in the, in the potential savings, because we were like this discussion of life cycle costs. We were also looking at a 20 year, in that instance, 20 year, um, uh, period um, where in reality it's going to be 30 year longer for most of the systems but we had to pick it uh, we had to pick it to something but it's a great point yeah I have one in my house and it's it's a really mediocre one and I, I save 60 percent of the cost of bringing in that cold outside air I mean some of the good ones are 80 percent or more so it's a big deal I, I don't I just don't know that I mean I know on the commercial side you know, so often it seems like when you get to these larger buildings, you'd think there'd be economies of scale, but it seems like either because they're just low volume or their design costs involved, the things are very expensive on the commercial and institutional side relative to residential. We are closing in on seven o'clock. Um, just some uh, back of the envelope figuring. It looks like Bodil is the next Elon Musk, so congratulations. Um, so. Um, thank you so much for coming, everybody. Um, visit the REAP website, um, talk to Chris, talk to Greg, and um, we can put you in touch with anybody that was on the panel or um, connect you with any of the information you heard tonight. So thanks again for coming. <laughs>